Hello, folks. I'm Josh McGee. Welcome to another episode of the Gateway to Soccer Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, I am back after a few weeks off from my previous episode. Hopefully, everyone's still doing well. I've had to take care of some family business as well as some schoolwork. I've been working on my master's throughout this summer, which has meant I've had to take four summer classes. So those have been kicking my butt just a little bit. So that is why uh, I've been gone so long. But before I head back to Iowa, the next couple of weeks, I hope to drop a couple of new episodes of the Gateway to Soccer Show starting with this week because there's so much going on. Really excited to talk about for this week's episode, the biggest tournament going on in world soccer. I'm gonna talk about some MLS news that broke this week that might concern a little bit of what St. Louis City SC could be looking at in terms of players. And of course, also, there's a big match going on here tonight in St. Louis, or I should say across the river here in the St. Louis area. I'll talk more a little bit about that at the end of the show. But again, really excited to get back to things here. Going to start off this week talking about U.S. soccer. That would be the U.S. men's national team and the U.S. women's national team. Some pretty interesting news. And of course, some big matches uh, going down this week for either team. So let's jump into it, but let's start off with the U.S. men's national team. The person making the most news on behalf of the U.S. men's national team this week has been head coach Greg Berhalter. He has been making the media rounds all over different outlets and different areas over this past week, drumming up excitement and talking a little bit about the U.S. men's national team headed to Qatar here in November to take part in the 2022 FIFA World Cup. You saw him at the MLB All-Star Game. You probably heard him on radio. He was on SportsCenter the other night. Again, talking about the U.S. men's national team. I caught his interview on The Herd with Colin Cowherd. Now, again, fair warning, Colin, not the biggest soccer guy. He's still got a lot to learn. Uh, this interview, some of the questions that he was dishing out weren't the best in the world, but I did think that Burr Halter did an excellent job of conducting himself and kind of, you know, stretching things out and kind of expanding upon some of the ideas that Colin was bringing up. And I did think that he had a few interesting things to say. I did was able to catch the uh, full, about 15 minutes or so, interview between him and Colin. I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some of the more interesting things that he had to say. One of the subjects that was brought up early on in the interview was the goalkeeping competition between Matt Turner and Zach Steffen. And if he had to choose right now, who would Greg Berhalter go with to start at the World Cup? Now, of course, Greg wasn't going to give a straight answer. Of course, he's not going to give that at this point. The competition is still ongoing. But he did make, again, a big point, which I think everyone is thinking about when it comes to uh, goalkeeping on the U.S. men's national team. Matt Turner, of course, just made a move to Arsenal. He's expected to compete for the starting goalkeeping spot, but in the end, I think it's going to go to Aaron Ramsdale, and of course, that would mean that Matt Turner would be number two and probably isn't going to get that much playing time from you. Again, you think about the season starting in August all the way up to November. There's not going to be many opportunities for Turner to get into some matches. Now you think about Zach Seffin. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a moment, but of course, at Manchester City, he faced the same problem. He just was not getting enough playing time. Again, he was number two behind Ederson there and was kind of, you know, relegated to just, you know, appearing in cups and maybe a Premier League match or two. But that was the same problem he faced. He wasn't getting enough game time. It's important right now for the U.S. men's national team players who are expected to be playing at the World Cup to get as much game time as possible. And of course, you know, going up against the best of the best all across Europe. Stefan and Turner locked in a real big competition here. If neither of them are really getting much playing time, it's going to make the choice for them, the number one spot to be even harder for Greg Berhalter. So he talked a little bit about that, talked about them, you know, trying to get some more time, you know, looking at the situation, to see how Turner plays out at Arsenal. Of course, you know, keeping an eye on Stefan as well. But I did think it was interesting, again, making the point that I think all of us are thinking about. The next point he made, which I found interesting, was that he talked up the difficulty of Group B, said it's going to be the U.S.'s priority to get out of the group before even thinking about what they could do in the knockout stage of the World Cup. Sounded a little bit like he might be tempering expectations. You know, some people might think of it as he's kind of laying the groundwork for some excuses. But again, I think it's a reality check for U.S. fans. This is not going to be an easy group to get out of. Of course, all the focus is going to be on that England match. But Wales, Iran, those are going to be the two matches that determine whether the U.S. is going to move on. Remember, the U.S. last time out didn't qualify for the World Cup. So to kind of boost expectations all of a sudden to we're going to make some noise in the knockout stage when we've got one of the youngest, if not the youngest teams going to the World Cup here in a couple of months, I think it's a little bit of extreme. So I think, again, kind of trying to, uh, you know, legitimize what all is going to happen here in Group B 
again, not just England, talking about Wales, talking about Iran. I think Burhalter kind of has the right mindset that the U.S. really has to focus and hone in on getting out of this group before, you know, thinking about potential scenarios and seeing how far that they could go. So again, I think just kind of bringing people back down and helping them realize that this group is not going to be a cakewalk, that that England game is going to be big. And of course, you know, they're going to look to try to get all three points in that just like they will against Wales and Iran. But the totality of this group is going to be a difficult task, especially because, you know, we're coming out of a stage where we didn't qualify for the World Cup. Now that we have with one of the youngest teams out there, this is going to be a huge test for the U.S. men's national team. Speaking of that youth, I think this was the most interesting point that Burr Halter had to make during this interview. Again, that's going to be the big storyline with the U.S., right? Not a lot of experience at World Cups, trying to rebound from missing the previous World Cup, trying to come up with some results, at least get out of this group, and potentially maybe make some noise in the knockout stages. Burr Halter actually thinks that youth could be an advantage to the U.S. He makes a really interesting point. Think about, again, the circumstances and the setting here of this World Cup. Again, being played at a different time, you know, in November instead of the summer, being played in Qatar, everyone's going to be in one city. All the teams are getting together one week before the World Cup. It's going to be a shorter timeline for teams to get ready. And, of course, the recovery periods, right? All these games are still going to be hot. In terms of your body being able to recover and move on to the next match, which you're only going to get a couple of days in between, it's going to be, you know, paramount for teams to be able to find a way to recover and get themselves ready for that next match. One thing that actually helps that process, youth. Again, being able to recover a lot quicker than some of the other teams will be able to do so because of the age gaps in between those teams. The U.S., again, having one of the most youngest teams, if not the youngest team, that will be headed to the World Cup, they'll be able to recover a lot faster than some of the other teams. Again, potentially going up against a team with a few older players such as Wales. Again, you know, think about Gareth Bale, Aaron Ramsey, some of those other guys, they're well above, you know, 30 years old versus the U.S. who average age about is 24. Could prove to be the difference in that match, depending upon the circumstances. So again, I think Burhalter knows about the inexperience of this team, but the fact, you know, the youthfulness, the exuberance, the athleticism that they possess here with this team could be used as an advantage uh, when you get down to the nitty gritty of trying to get out of this group. So again, I think that's kind of a good take, a kind of a good outlook on this team that yes, may not have a lot of big match experience, not a lot of World Cup experience, but their youthfulness can play a role in helping them advance. And then lastly, just kind of a fun point that Burhalter made that I definitely agree with. Again, talking a little bit about some of the individual players on this team, a lot of Christian Pulisic talk, obviously. Uh, Weston McKinney gets mentioned a few times. Tyler Adams gets mentioned in this interview. But uh, Cowherd basically comes out and asks Burhalter, who's going to surprise fans at the World Cup from this team? And the name that Burhalter chose here was Yunus Musa. And I completely agree with that. Musa, again, it was such a fight to get him to commit to the U.S. men's national team. The U.S. were able to win that battle. Of course, you know, Musa, you know, over there in Spain with Valencia, trying to make a headway in the early parts of his career, has completely taken this team by storm. He's basically solidified his place there in that midfield three behind the front three of the U.S. men's national team. He can be a complete tear, box to box, absolutely doing everything on both sides of the ball. And I agree with Burhalter. I think, you know, the casual U.S. fan may not know a lot about Musa yet, but they're going to be tremendously impressed with what he can offer on both sides for this team. And his role and what he does is going to be tremendously important against teams like England, against a team like Wales, who have all these tremendous offensive players. Musa can be a guy who can basically track some of these guys by himself and be able to find a way to break up play and kind of, you know, corrupt them and basically mess things up there in midfield. So I like that Burr Halter was given some shine to a guy, may not fill up, you know, the box score with goals and assists, but a guy who is tremendously important to the U.S. men's national team. And I'm very excited to see what he can do at the World Cup. So those are just some thoughts from Greg Berhalter that I found interesting from this one interview. Of course, he did several interviews this week as a part of a kind of the media rounds, hyping up the U.S. men's national team. I want to wrap up this chat or this portion of it, talking about the U.S. men's national team and some of the moves that some of these players have been making over the summer, at least over the past couple of weeks. Again, I mentioned Zach Steffen battling it out with Matt Turner for the starting goalkeeping position for the U.S. Stefan has been loaned out to Middlesbrough by Manchester City, again, in an effort to get him some playing time for Manchester City side, but of course from the U.S. men's national team side. It's important for Stefan to try to get back into form. He has dropped off a little bit over the past year or two, which has kind of given way for Matt Turner to assert himself as a potential number one for the U.S. Stefan now 
going to a club who desperately need him. Uh, he's going to play a lot more than he did at Man City. Maybe not against you know the best competition in the world in the Premier League, but still very good competition over there in England in the championship. So Stefan now will get more opportunities there. Some of the other guys that have been moving over the past couple of weeks, you know, Tyler Adams has joined Brendan Aronson at Leeds United. Again, one I think one of the funniest gimmicks from this summer has been the redubbing of Leeds United, Leeds United States FC. Uh, again, now you got Aronson, you got Adams, and of course, American manager Jesse Marsh over there. It's going to be really fun to watch them uh, over the course of this next season. Then, of course, you got someone like Shaq Moore, who could be used as, you know, depth, could be a backup outside back for the U.S. He is moving back to America and will be playing for Nashville SC. Another American who could potentially be making a move, this is still kind of rumor at this point, it's not official, but Chris Richards could be making the move from the Bundesliga to Crystal Palace and the Premier League. Again, another opportunity for a guy like Richards who needs more playing time to get it at a club in the Premier League would be huge for him. He could potentially be one of the starting two center backs for the US when it comes time in November. So you got that group of players making moves over the past couple of weeks. Of course, we know about Brendan Aronson making the move to Leeds United already. Haven't heard any updates on Christian Pulisic at Chelsea. Of course, you know, this week started for them in one of their preseason friendlies, scored versus Charlotte FC. So potentially he could be staying. We'll have to see how much playing time uh, that he gets over the next couple of months before the World Cup. But still, again, you're going to see a lot of U.S. men's national team player movement here trying to, again, jockey for position, find places to where they can play so they can kind of put themselves at the front of the queue for potentially being on this World Cup roster. Switching gears to the U.S. Women's National Team, of course, the big news for them this week was the fact that they were in action at the CONCACAF W Championship. They made it to the final match, going up against longtime foes Canada, able to exert some revenge on Canada for when they hung that loss on them at the past Olympics. The U.S. were able to win this match by a score of 1-0, thanks to a 78th-minute penalty from Alex Morgan. The win officially clinched the U.S. is spot at the 2024 Olympics there in Paris, France. They would already qualified for the next World Cup, thanks to them getting to the semifinals of this tournament. But again, the U.S. able to get things done here. They kept a clean sheet in all five matches at the CONCACAF W Championship, and they outscored their opponents 13 to nil. This was just a great tournament for the U.S. Again, the defense looked extremely strong, still being led, of course, by goalkeeper Alyssa Nair and Becky Sauerbrunn back there in defense. But the U.S., again, this was really cool. They welcomed back a lot of players that hadn't been with the team in a while. Again, Alex Morgan had a tremendous tournament. It was good to see Megan Rapino back as well. But, of course, they're still working in some of these new players. You've got Trinity Rodman. You've got Sophia Smith. You've got Mallory Pugh, who's been with the U.S., but still now getting a lot more opportunities there up top. This was really cool to see. The U.S., of course, is on the verge of that transition, of transitioning away from players like Rapino, like Morgan, like Sauerbrunn, and bringing in a new crop of players to continue the dominance of what the U.S. have been offering here over the past few years. Again, obviously, they're expected to win these types of tournaments versus CONCACAF opposition. Obviously, Canada has given them some trouble here over the past couple of years, but everybody else they're expected to beat. But they took care of business. They were able to qualify for both the World Cup and for the Olympics. And again, we're able to transition and offer some opportunities to some players who just hadn't been getting those looks before. So a successful tournament for Vlatko Andonovsky and the U.S. Women's National Team. And of course, now the focus will be getting prepared for these upcoming tournaments over the next few years, looking ahead to the next World Cup in 2023. Moving away now from the two U.S. national teams, but sticking with women's soccer, I want to talk about the biggest tournament going on in international soccer at the moment, and that would be the 2022 Women's European Championships. It's been so cool to see this tournament. If you haven't seen any of it, you are missing out I want to first start off by saying it's been really cool to see that most of the matches have been on regular ESPN cable. I think only one or two have been stashed away on ESPN+. Plus. But these matches have been on the mornings and afternoons, and they have been fantastic. It's been a great tournament, a great showcase for how much soccer has developed uh, in terms of the women's game over there in Europe. Of course, England are the hosts, and lucky for them and the home fans there, they have made it on to the semifinals. Let's talk about that first quarterfinal matchup, England versus Spain, a couple of heavyweights there. Spain, of course, started this tournament by missing Balin Dior winner Alexia Putellas, uh, not being available. Again, she tore her ACL just a couple of days before the start of this tournament, just a uh, horrible injury. But they found a way to make it to the knockout stage still. They actually outplayed England for the majority of this match, outshot them 17-8 to eight in the end, and outpossessed them by a range of 56% to 44%. Spain were up 1-0 late, but it was a goal in the 84th minute from Ella Toon 
which made the score of 1-1 and made it go to extra time. An extra time, just a fantastic strike, a screamer from Georgia Stanway, which put England up 2-1, and that ended up being the match winner, England moving on to the semifinals. Great teams find ways to win, even in tough situations against tough teams. That is what England did here. I don't want to start, you know, getting a little too cocky here, but the England women might be able to teach a thing or two about to the England's men's national team about finding ways and dealing with pressure because they were able to find a way to win this match. Of course, it's been across the board, the talent there uh, that they've had. Beth Mead, again, having a fantastic tournament for the three Lionesses. You've got Ellen White up top. You've got someone like Fran Kirby there in the midfield as well. Of course, Lucy Brown's back there in defense. England, they were loaded before, and now, of course, they continue to maintain that path as one of the favorites to win this whole thing. Excellent job finding a way to come back and make that a match versus Spain. I think a lot of England's success has to be attributed to their new coach there in Serena Wegman. Again, she was the one who's behind the success for the Netherlands at the previous Euros when they hosted and they were able to win that tournament. Uh, she came over first, I think, non-English uh, manager in the English national team's history on the women's side. She's been doing tremendous work and, of course, has been able to help get England to this stage. In terms of all the other action at the tournament, of course, this episode uh, is being taped right now during the uh, Germany versus Austria semifinals. We'll have to get that result scrolling down below. Germany have looked, honestly, like the best team in this tournament. Of course, hopefully that won't come back to bite me. But you think about the, the group stage, they were able to shut out all three of their opponents. It was a big 4-0 win versus Denmark to kick things off. Then a 2-0 win versus Spain. They have looked extremely good after it seemed like the press had kind of written them off, saying, you know, kind of like the men's team, that they're transitioning away from some of their stars and they need to find a new group of stars to help lead them into the future. They still look really, really good. Uh, in terms of other results, there have been a lot of blowouts, you know, across this tournament. You think about England, of course, 8-0 versus Norway because of an early red card. Whoosh, that was tough to watch. But elsewhere, there have been some really good matches. I think about, like, the Netherlands-Portugal match at the group stage. Netherlands versus Sweden as well. You think about, again, France was in a couple of close results after a big win versus Italy to kick things off. But France have looked really good. Germany have looked really good. Of course, you've got Sweden in the knockout stage as well. Potentially could be one of those other teams to help challenge England here during the final stages. So we'll have to see how things kind of shake out here at the end. You've got Sweden versus Belgium. And then, of course, you've got France versus the Netherlands as well over the weekend. So, again, this has been a very exciting tournament. The goal scoring has been off the charts. And, again, teams, you know, the heavyweights, they're still hanging around. But there have been some couple of different surprises uh, as we get into the knockout stage here at the Euros, that made this a really exciting tournament. Again, I think the coverage has been fantastic. Broadcasting has been really good. Loving the halftime, you know, post and pregame uh, studio shows. Of course, I'm biased. Uh, the head coach of Chelsea, Emma Hayes, has been heavily involved. I think she is just a fantastic coach. She's got a brilliant mind. I think it's someone who could really help uh, move the women's game. And I think, again, I think she'd be fit to coach over on the men's side. I would really like to see her get that opportunity someday. I think that she's just fantastic. But I think ESPN has been doing a great job of covering this tournament. It's been an exciting tournament nonetheless. And really looking forward to see, can England, you know, finish the job and win it on home soil? Or are they going to get taken out by one of these other heavyweights uh, competing at this tournament? But still, folks, you got time. Jump in, watch the Euros. It's been great so far, and it's going to get even better. Now I want to switch over to MLS and give my thoughts on the tables for the Eastern and Western Conference at this point in the season. Catching up on the Eastern Conference off the back of a three-match winning streak, including a tying the record for largest margin of victory in MLS history versus their rivals, DC United, 7-0. Philadelphia Union find themselves at the top of the Eastern Conference by one point over NYC FC, who, of course, are coming off of a 1-0 victory on the road versus their rivals, New York Red Bulls, who are in third place right behind them. Finishing out the rest of that conference, you've got CF Montreal in fourth, Orlando City SC in fifth, Columbus Crew, a little bit of a rebound there. They've moved up to sixth place, and then right behind them, their rivals there, FC Cincinnati, much improved, at least by their previous standards uh, this season, holding down that final playoff spot currently. Taking a look at teams outside the playoff picture, of course, really disappointing season for New England Revolution. Of course, they've lost a lot of players. We already talked about Matt Turner, but they've lost a few other guys up top, but they just don't have that same, you know, cutting edge that they did last season that helped catapult them to first place in the Eastern Conference. Then you go way down to the bottom of the table, DC United, again, losing 7-0 to your rivals. That is a pretty huge indictment, and they have turned to a former player to try to help lead them out of this funk, and that would be Wayne Rooney coming to the U.S. to coach. Of course, we've 
know about him in, at Derby County, uh, being a player coach there, now returning to DC United after he had played there, of course, during his career, now moving in to take on that head coach role. We'll see. I mean, anything's got to be better than what they're doing right now. Just above them, you have Toronto FC, who have been disappointing this season, but could be receiving some reinforcements that could catapult them close to being in contention for a playoff spot. We knew about Lorenzo Insigne coming over as a summer signing, but now, of course, on a free transfer, they will be getting Fernando Bernadeschi as well from Syria A, and they also made a deal to acquire Mark Anthony K. So again, a couple of offensive guys could prove to be a big help for Toronto FC, but they're down there in the table as are DC United. Not sure if they will be able to find a way to get back towards the top. Philly, again, a tremendously balanced side, especially uh, defensively is where they dominate. NYCFC could be interesting to see. We know about Tati Castellanos. He will be moving on after this weekend, make a move, I believe, to Girona. So that's going to be a pretty big loss for them. We'll see how much that affects uh, what they've been doing. Of course, you've got established clubs like the Red Bulls, like Columbus, uh, Orlando having a pretty solid season as well in the midst there in the playoff push. So I think it's a wide open Eastern Conference by the looks of things. Could be a lot of movement here over the next few weeks. Of course, we're approaching the All-Star uh, break and game as well soon. So we'll have to see how that affects some teams. But right now, Philly looking really good. Other teams could have some upcoming questions here as we approach the next few weeks. Now looking over at the Western Conference, the club right now that is leading all of MLS on 42 points would be LAFC. Of course, recently coming off of the big El Chapico win versus the LA Galaxy. Now they have Gigiorio Chiellini and Gareth Bale in the fold. They are firing on all cylinders right now. Have a loaded team. Excited to see what both Bale and Chiellini can do on either side of the ball for LAFC as they continue their push to finally breaking through and potentially winning an MLS Cup. Right behind them, though, just one point difference there would be Austin FC. Again, building off of that tremendous start to the season that they had. They've kept pace with LAFC, uh, doing a tremendous job there in only their second season in MLS. Right behind them, you've got Real Salt Lake. Bounce back season for them. Not usually up this far in the table, but doing an excellent job so far this season. In fourth, you've got Minnesota United FC. In fifth, you've got Nashville SC. In sixth, you've got FC Dallas. And holding on to that final playoff spot at the moment would be the LA Galaxy. Kind of an eclectic group there. Minnesota United, we know, got off to a slow start. They found a way to bounce back here. Nashville, again, usually a club who can put together a string of solid results, also holding the playoff spot. Of course, we know about the Galaxy, uh, you know, finding some struggles in terms of just not having the star power that they once did, but still finding ways to pick up wins. FC Dallas has also been a pretty consistent club over the years. Two clubs, though, that we usually associate with playoff spots who are struggling right now would be Seattle Sounders FC and Sporting Kansas City. The Sounders right now are in the midst of a three-match losing streak highlighted by a 3-0 loss at home to the rivals Portland Timbers. All is not well right now in Seattle. Uh, again, kind of dealing, as all the clubs are doing right now, with a couple of different injuries, but right now they're just not playing the same way that we've come to know them to play over these past few years in which they've dominated MLS. Right now in a real funk and in danger. As I said, previous episodes, I said, don't worry about the slow start, Seattle. They got to get through the CONCACAF uh, Champions League. And then once they do that, everything will be okay. Well, that has not been the case. It's been a slow start that has turned into a slow season. And they need to find a way to pick it up. And like I also mentioned, Sporting KC, right now last in the Western Conference, they have the worst goal difference in all of MLS. This is due to a league worst 19 goal score. They just don't have the firepower up top. You know about Alan Polito um, moving on, not actually working out for Spurring KC. They just haven't found anybody up top to really put home the goals and really push this team back up to where we know them to be. So a couple of surprises there in the Western Conference. Not surprising though, LAFC uh, dominating here in the regular season. But an interesting group, like I said, right there in the Western Conference. There are a couple of lower seeded teams, I'm thinking about Nashville, I'm thinking about Minnesota that could prove to be some challenging teams there in the playoffs to prevent LAFC from moving to that MLS Cup final. But right now, again, a lot of excitement there in both conferences uh, at the top. LAFC versus Philadelphia may not make too many headlines, but would be a pretty cool MLS Cup final if the top seeds were able to move on. But still, a lot to be played for here over the last couple months of the season. Before moving on to talk some St. Louis soccer, I do want to talk about this article that broke this week on MLSsoccer.com by Tom Bogert and Matthew Doyle, detailing the list of upcoming free agents for the 2023 season in MLS. The full list of players, as well as those who are going to be on a club option 
for next year was released by the MLS Players Association. And I'll go through some of those guys in terms of the club option guys here in a second. But I want to talk about some of the names these guys mentioned as free agents. Guy at the top of the list, Aaron Long, of course, New York Red Bull center back, mainstay on the U.S. men's national team. He is going to be a free agent. Somebody else who was at the top of the list from Sporting KC for Daniel Shalloway. Again, mid-20s type of guy who has got a good track record of scoring goals in MLS. A lot of veterans who are going to be out of contracts here uh, in the upcoming offseason. you got someone like Ajasi Zardes, somebody like Alejandro Bedoya, somebody like Ola Kamara, somebody also like Jonathan Osario, who guys who are in their low to mid-30s who, have, of course, had great careers in MLS who could still potentially contribute somewhere else. Of course, looking at this from a St. Louis City SC perspective, who are some of these guys that they could potentially target? If we've looked at their signings so far, for the most part, they've been signing guys in their low to mid-20s, looking for guys who are about to enter, who have already entered their prime, guys with huge upside who fit their system. I don't know if someone like Azardes or Bedoya is going to be able to work, considering that they are entering you know, their low to mid-30s. Somebody like even an Aaron Long, who would be great. He's got a ton of experience. A defense you can never have enough of. But approaching age 30, is that someone who you, uh, St. Louis City SC are going to track? Somebody who St. Louis was linked to in this article is 27-year-old center back for LAFC, Franco Escobar. Escobar will turn 28 just before next season. He's only made seven starts for LA this year, but he has a lot of experience in MLS. He was a part of the 2018 MLS Cup winning team over there at Atlanta United FC. Somebody who potentially could fit uh, St. Louis' system. Again, only going to be 28 when he plays next year. Somebody who could potentially play outside as well as at center back. So again, these are the types of guys that St. Louis are going to look to target here when it comes to free agents in MLS. Some of the other guys who could potentially be other targets, uh, somebody like a Derek Etienne Jr. is going to be a free agent as well, a player that I like over there at Columbus. Some guys who are going to have club options. We don't know if they're going to be declined or accepted, but potentially could become available. Miles Robinson at Atlanta United. It's going to be a tough uh, choice for them. Of course, he had the Achilles injury. Uh, that has kept him out for this season, going to keep him out of the World Cup for the U.S. But, of course, he was playing phenomenally well and could be someone that could really help out uh, St. Louis City SC should he become available. You've got MLS veterans and good players like Alvis Paul, Kellen Acosta, Latif Blessing, Maxi Morales, Jordan Morris, and Julian Gressel, who are all going to be on club options, who, again, it's going to be up to these teams to pick them up. If they don't, they become free agents and potentially could become available for St. Louis City SC to sign. It's all about, again, fitting St. Louis' system. That's been the commitment from Lutz Fan and Shield, from Bradley Carnell, and the rest of this club. You've been looking for those types of players who are entering their prime or who are currently in their prime, not so much looking for someone, again, like a Jossi Zardes or an Alejandro Bedoya. Now, of course, those guys could still be brought in as MLS veterans to play in limited roles and to help out uh, with these players adjusting to MLS. But for the most part, it doesn't seem like those types of players are going to fit the system for St. Louis. But still, it's exciting to think that in just a couple months' time, these players will hit the market and St. Louis City SC will look to kind of round out the rest of their team and kind of pick up some of these types of guys to help lead them in their inaugural season in MLS. Speaking of guys who have signed for St. Louis City SC, the club completed the signing of Danish winger Isaac Jensen from a Danish under-19 youth league team. I got the name down here, but I think it would be a disservice if I even tried to pronounce it. But he did score eight goals in 29 appearances for them last season. Jensen has also scored for the Danish under-18 and under-19 national teams. So again, exciting signing here for City. Uh, he predominantly plays, I believe, on the left as a winger guy who's going to take on defenders 1v1, try to create some chaos with his speed, a really young player, again, someone who's going to be approaching his prime over the next couple of years, fits the mold of what City want to do here with this first team. So Jensen's going to take up an international slot. We'll see. You're going to slot him up top there with some of the other offensive signings that St. Louis has put together already, but could be another one of these guys that you're buying into the upside early on with the hope that he turns into a really good player once he approaches his prime. So again, Jensen now into the fold with the rest of the St. Louis City SC signs. We'll have to see if uh, during this current transfer window, if the club are finished or if they've got a couple more surprises up their sleeve. Next up, I want to talk about City 2 and their campaign in the inaugural MLS Next Pro season. They currently hold on to one of the four playoff spots there in the Western Conference, but they face a pretty pivotal matchup here tonight going up against North Texas SC. 
Right now, City 2, they are in second place, one point behind the Tacoma Defiance and one point ahead of Houston Dynamo 2 and only two points ahead of North Texas who are in fourth place. So again, big time matchup here. North Texas could potentially hop City 2 in the standings. Of course, City 2 could hold them off and depending on how things go, could take that first spot in the conference ahead of a matchup with the Tacoma Defiance, which will happen next weekend on the road. So again, big game here tonight for St. Louis City SC2. Again, hosting North Texas SC. Could potentially see the debut, or at least we're expected to see the debut of goalkeeper Roman Berkey. He has had all his paperwork sorted out. He is supposed to be with City 2 for tonight's matchup. That is going to be exciting to see him finally uh, debut in a City kit and be able to help out a great City 2 team right now. Uh, completely, you know, blowing people away, at least blowing away expectations right now. I believe they're up to 10 wins this season already. Right now, holding on to one of those playoff spots. Yes, there's still a couple months left to go in the season, but still, it's matchups like these, matchups like next weekend, which will pave the way and kind of give us a clearer picture of where City might finish in the standings. They'll have a couple more matchups against, I believe, again, North Texas on the road, and one more matchup against a potential playoff team. The rest of the schedule, though, against teams lower on in the table. So again, real chance here for City this weekend and next weekend to solidify their place near the top of the standings, potentially, you know, hold on to a playoff spot in their first season, not just as a club, but also in the first MLS next pro season as well. So again, exciting tonight. Uh, get out there and support City 2 versus North Texas SC, but fighting, battling, jockeying for playoff position here in MLS next pro. One last piece of St. Louis City SC news. The club announced on Wednesday, Lou Fuse Automotive Network as a founding partner and unveiled the Lou Fuse Plaza and the Lou Fuse Automotive Gate on the eastern side of Centene Stadium. I'm going to put some of the renderings up now as I talk about this. Again, not too much of a surprise. Again, you think about Lou Fuse and all they've done for soccer here in St. Louis. It's a no-brainer to kind of put them together as a partner with St. Louis City SC. Of course, this is a big deal. This plaza is going to be the main plaza where people are going to enter into the stadium. It's going to have lots of events. I believe in the announcement, they said there's going to be a concession stand that serves both outside and inside the stadium. Again, different forms of entertainment will be out there as well. But again, it's just going to be a general kind of meeting place for fans before they enter the stadium. Lou Fuse, again, being involved in terms of what they've done for soccer here in St. Louis is a big plus. Happy to see that these two uh, partners have been able to get together here and put something together of meaning. Of course, you know, kind of confirming all of what Lufius has done for soccer here in St. Louis. So pretty big deal there. I know obviously people are probably, you know, expecting a few more announcements concerning the stadium, concerning some matches maybe upcoming there since we're about ready to see the completion of it, but still important to have Lufius in the fold now. Uh, really cool just to see what they will be a part of and what they will be doing here with City. And lastly, to wrap up the show, I want to do a local soccer roundup, especially giving a couple of shout outs to a couple of clubs who wrapped up their tenure in St. Louis. First though, I want to start off with Club Atletico St. Louis. They wrapped up their NPSL schedule, but they have a new exciting opportunity here in STL. They have partnered with Mo Liga, who was named a U.S. Federation for the game of tech ball. If you don't know what tech ball is, it's basically like soccer table tennis. Basically, you know, playing table tennis with your feet, your head, uh, basically the same rules applied there. Club Atletico have partnered with Mo Liga to kind of host tech ball tournaments, uh, events, leagues, that such. You can find more information on Club Atletico's Facebook page. I know Ricky Garza put out a promotional video there talking a little bit about more information about the partnership. So definitely go and check that out and see if you want to be a part of that. But again, also uh, supporting the Bluebirds and what they're doing as they start the off-season portion of what they do, which of course is all about helping out in the community. So again, just want to give a little bit of shine to them and this new opportunity that they have picked up. Next up, Fire and Ice Soccer Club wrapped up their 10-year run with a 6-2 record in the WPSL this season. Their only two losses came against KC Current 2, which is basically the NWSL club's reserve team. So much higher level of competition there. Those were their only two losses. They basically handled everybody else. A great goal scoring record, great defensive record as well. Um, just adds to their all-time record and the success that they had during their 10-year run and all that they were able to do there. Uh, again, club founder and club coach, of course, Lindsay Eversmeyer has taken up a new position. She will be the head coach of the Southwestern Illinois College men's soccer team. Really exciting opportunity. Congrats to Lindsay. Thank you to her for having me out to multiple matches over the past couple of years to be able to cover this team and all that they've been able to do 
uh, in the WPSL. It's been exciting, of course. Really sad to see Fire and Ice go, but of course they've provided so many opportunities for so many players from the St. Louis area over the years. And of course, laid the groundwork for future advances for women's soccer here in this city. So again, congrats to Lindsay, congrats to Fire and Ice on a great 10 year run. And lastly, the St. Louis Lions wrapped up their tenure here in the St. Louis area as well. The Lions completed their seasons in the USLW League and USL League Two respectively. I was at the men's match this past Saturday uh, where they lost a tough decision 1-0 versus Caw Valley FC that basically knocked them out of playoff contention. Again, tough end to the season. It was good to have the Lions back on the men's side after a year off. For the women, uh, it was a tough season, but again, competing uh, for the first time in the USLW League was a tremendous opportunity. Actually took Minnesota Aurora FC to the wire, only lost to them 3-2. to two. Uh, Aurora, I believe, went undefeated this season and came away with the championship. So the fact that the Lions were able to play them close was an extremely impressive accomplishment. I was able to talk to the founder of the St. Louis Lions and, of course, one of the coaches on the men's side in Tony Glavin after the match. Talked to him about the match itself, but, of course, more so about his tenure with the Lions, what the club has been able to accomplish over the years, and just what he's been happy to be a part of. So here's that interview. Hopefully you all enjoy so tonight's match, just a little bit unlucky. I would say, again, first 45 minutes seemed, again, pretty even match between the two sides, just them able to nick that goal off of the uh, set-piece corner kick there. In the second half, you guys were able to push. A few chances that uh, the keeper had to make a couple of spectacular saves on. Uh, but unfortunately, of course, the result tonight, uh, not the one that you guys were looking for, but thoughts overall on the match. Yeah, definitely. Y you know, I can't say we were bad, but it wasn't our best game overall. Um... I thought we did better in the second half. You know, they defended well. We have to give them some credit. They defended well. We created some two great opportunities. Uh, we, we created, uh, you know, two great... Uh, actually, we had three chances because Charlie, uh, on a different day, Charlie hits the net. You know, it's just the way it is. Uh, just the way indicative of how, how the game went. Uh, today, so uh, we certainly can't fault the players. They worked so hard, and you know it was uh, challenging. I think we we gave away the ball that led to the corner. That was disappointing, you know. But it happens, you know. Unfortunately, it happens. Uh, but I thought we did enough in the second half to maybe get one. But the old saying is, you got to take your chances, and we didn't do that. So, but overall, uh, from a season standpoint guys have done very well they've worked hard so in terms of now you know looking at this point it's always tough to kind of look back and you're always thinking what could we have done better what could we have done you know to improve our positioning the last few matches leading up to this one that put you guys kind of in this position in the standings talk to me a little bit about the past few weeks you know kind of managing bodies health of course and then of course you know uh, a match or two ago again the, the red cards that were issued and things like that how tough has it been to kind of manage those types of circumstances yeah now overall and, and i think if we look at coming into today you know Carl valley got a forfeit from uh chicago dutch lions there's no doubt that helped them that's, a, that's an easy three points now i'm not saying that they wouldn't have won but if you don't play the game you don't know so that in itself certainly pushed them. You know, for us, looking at us, you know, we lost two games on the road in Wichita. Those were challenging games. We were, we were about to make a change on the second game and the player who, you know, got the, the, the uh, second yellow, it was, that's how close it was. We were just getting ready to make the change and he gets the second yellow, so he threw everything off. And at that time we were, you know, we, we were on the ascendancy, things were looking well, we, you know, no guarantee you scored, but things were looking good at that, t at that point, you know. That for me was a turning point, you know, I thought that was challenging. If, even if we took a point, it changes everything, you know, so it, it, it changes that. But um, again, overall, the, the, the management, the players and talking to Martin before, you know, we had a, we had a big squad, we made, you know, our you know, Martin had made changes early in the season, you know, trying to rotate players, and it worked out well. We were forced into some changes, and the guys did well. They responded well. So overall, you know, I think our management, you know, that's our first loss at home. You know, we've lost four games out of 13. You know, it's not the end of the world losing four games, but when everybody's close, 
you know, that makes a difference, you know. So I think coming into the season, I said this to the players today, coming into the season, you know, and I said this before the game, you know, three games that we lost, you know, out of 12 games, it really isn't, you know, you, you'd almost take that coming into the season, you know, and take your chances on it. So, um, but the other, some of the other teams are, are right in there and, I've always said that there's no easy games in, in the USL too, and there, there never has been over the years. So it's challenging. You've got to be ready for every game. And again, it boils down to, you know, the little things that, that the Wichita, you know, cost us a little bit. Yeah, a little bit of, you know, sometimes you can, I don't, certainly don't blame players, you know, because the last game there was, there was two red cards at the end, but it, the game was over. I, I wasn't up there, but the game was over by the time these happened and it didn't affect the game obviously you know which is a good thing because you don't want that to you know on discipline where it hurts is having those players out where they can't participate in the next game you know so it puts the onus on the players who are available you know so you know from that standpoint i think from the management i think uh, martin did a great job in balancing the players you know overall that the changes he had to make and the changes he made by choice I think went well, I must so, say. In terms of just, again, looking forward now, it's just the one match left, and then, of course, there will be a transition here uh, with the ending of your tenure with the Lions and such. In terms of, you know, kind of wrapping it all up in a bow and looking at this group especially as well, because the, the goal has always been about developing players. You have an amazing track record there with this club in terms of doing that. In terms of, you know, wrapping things up here with the Lions, how do you look at it? Uh, in terms of from that perspective, being able to develop these players. Well, and, and, and um, I'm glad you, you, you made that point because that was, you know, the biggest uh, and, and the main focus for me when I started, you know, the Lions was to help move players on. And uh, I think that's, that's definitely the thing that, uh, you, you know, I know I'm most proud of. Uh, and and uh, I, I can't tell you the number of players who not only the, the players that went on and played professionally, but the, the, the players who went on and coached and who are still coaching, you know. I mean, there's, there's two of them right here, Martin and, and Brock. You know, Martin played in the 2007 team and a few years later, Brock played in the 2006 and seven year. You know, I, I, I mean, I can't tell you the numbers of, of uh, coaches that, you know, that have represented the Lions. And, you know, this has just been a pathway and, and helping those players. And I hear from a lot of them and, you know, some I'm, I'm certainly, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to, to help mentor them in, in, in many ways. And, you know, that, that's a very rewarding thing, you know, and, and I must say that. So for me, uh, you know, yeah, we want to win and we, we tend to lose sight of, you know, the bigger picture of, you know, the, the connections of the players. So I know for me, you know, looking at retirement a year down the road, you know, I, I look forward to, you know, looking up on some of these young coaches and seeing how they do and hopefully they'll carry things on in, 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 their, in their career and development. I appreciate Tony taking the time to speak with me. Of course, all that he's been able to do for me over the past couple of years, allowing me to come out to watch matches for both men's and women's St. Louis Lions will be merging into St. Charles FC, who are supposed to start play in the USLW League and in USL League Two next year. Tony's going to be with them, of course, like he said, for one year. Of course, he will look forward then to a long and happy retirement. Thanks to him. Thanks to Coach Jeff Lorimer on the women's side for all the access for speaking with me and helping me with, out, uh, with my coverage over the past couple of seasons. That's going to do it for this episode of the Gateway to Soccer Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, don't forget to like comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Got one more episode in me, I think, next week before I head off to Iowa and be on a little bit of another hiatus as I complete my second year there, get back to doing some broadcasting as well. But it's good to get back here, talk a lot about what is going on in soccer. So much going on off the field as there is on the field. Of course, again, over the past couple of weeks, really excited to be talking about the U.S. men's national team and the World Cup coming up. Of course, the Premier League season's only a couple of weeks away as well along with the rest of the international schedule. So again, really exciting times here as we get ready for another great year of soccer. Hope to see you all back here next week. But until then, have a great weekend.